you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. The Chris Voss Show. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by. And once again, we have another brilliant guest on the show. Uh, uh, well, uh, documented author he's the author of a ton of books we'll get an exact number out of him here, here in a bit uh but in the meantime as always you know put your arm around that friend neighbor relative that family member and say you know i wish you were smarter you should subscribe to the chris voss show Ah, eh, maybe you shouldn't say it that way but uh, you know what i mean you can find some nice way to see it tell them to go to goodreads.com for says chris voss youtube.com for just chris voss linkedin.com for says chris voss and there's two channels we're publishing on trying to become the cool kids over there on tiktok at chris voss one and uh the chris voss show podcast uh so uh, i don't know how it's working out my dogs seem to do better my huskies seem to do better on their videos over there than my accounts but you know we'll see what happens uh he is the author of the amazing new book that has just come out April 11th, 2023. Roy Peter Clark joins us on the show. His latest book is Tell It Like It Is. Is it like playing it again, Sam, from Casablanca? Tell It Like It Is, a clear guide to clear... Or I'm sorry, let me cut that again. Tell It Like It Is, a guide to clear and honest writing. Uh, just came out, so you can get it hot off the presses. Uh, and uh, Roy is uh, been called America's writing coach as stated in his mission is to help create a nation of writers since 1977 he's taught writing to small children and to Pulitzer winning authors from his mothership the Pointer Institute a school for journalism and democracy in St. Petersburg Florida he is the author or editor of 17 books on writing, language, and journalism. I think he told me closer to 20, though, now, so this maybe needs some updating. The latest, all published by Little, Little Brown, are writing tools. The Glamour Grammar, or I'm sorry, the Glamour of Grammar. I clearly flunked high school. Uh, and Help for Writers, which is now also a mobile app. His work has been featured on the Today Show, NPR, and the Oprah Winfrey Show. Uh, and now he reaches the pinnacle of his career on the Chris Foss Show. Or not. I don't know. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Roy. How are you? Chris, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And I love the energy. We, we have lots of energy. We just can't pronounce grammar properly. So we have that. God, give us your dot com so people can find you on the interwebs www.roypeterclark.com. There you go. Simple and easy. Uh, so, uh, Roy, did you want to send here 17 books? I know we talked about 20 in the pre-show. Do, do you want to throw an exact number at us so we uh, we have the record straight there? Yeah, I need to update that uh, <laughs> that bio you read. Yeah, you know, I, so, so um, my first book was called Free to Write. It's out of print, but it was about uh, my experiments in teaching children to write in oh. uh, elementary schools. And when my daughters were uh, going to school, I would visit their class as kind of a, you know, a, uh, a volunteer parent. But I was also trying to figure out at the time, I said, you know, if I, if I want to become a good and helpful writing coach, then maybe I should figure things out at the beginning, like what happens in the experience of children that leads some of them to want to become writers and some of them to want to avoid writing and reading. You know, I wanted to kind of sort of not just read about that or hear about it, but experience it uh, sort of directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first book. And, uh, and so tell it like it is, is the, is 19 books later. So my books are about reading, writing, editing, literature, grammar, language, and journalism in general. 
I need to read more of them if mm -hmm. people have heard my language and my inability to read properly. I suppose it depends on what mood I'm in, I swear, or whether my eyes are working in my old age. <laughs> so what motivated you want to write this latest book? Well, uh, I remember after I finished um, the 19th book, are, are you a, um, a Seinfeld fan by any chance? Yeah, it's a great show. Yeah, it was a great show. So my wife and I are currently uh, watching it from the beginning, you know, on Netflix, wow. which is something we've never done. We're up to the to season eight, and um, there's a season in which there's a there's an episode in which Kramer has um, a literary kind of moment, and he winds up publishing a coffee table book about coffee tables i remember this yeah and the book comes with these little legs that you can fold down and turn it into a little coffee table <laughs> and it becomes a success he he says he sells he said i sold the film rights the so, film rights for a coffee table book. So that inspired my 19th book which has the odd and interesting title if i may hold it up called murder your darlings oh yes and um, which is a, a bit of advice from a, a British professor from a century ago. Um, and it is a writing book about writing books. Oh. So I took, uh, I looked at about 50 writing books covering about 3,000 years of, of history from Aristotle to a great contemporary editor, William Zinzer, from A to Z. And uh, I extract what I think is the, the nugget of information, the, the tip that's most used, that has been most useful to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was my 19th book. And I said, OK, this is it. I'm done. You know, I'm ready to do a different kind of writing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then uh, everybody knows what happened at the beginning of 2020. Oh yeah, yeah. What? Um, what? Something, ha something happened. What? Yeah, exactly. And Can I get a memo on this. And the world's turned upside down. Mm -hmm. They say in, in Hamilton the musical, and and I began to watch very very closely how not just journalists but kind of a, a national community of public writers, scientists educators, economists, speech writers, politicians, as well as journalists, um, were working hard to, to help us figure out what was going on, how to live without panic, how to make good decisions, how to separate good information from disinformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, as if the pandemic weren't enough, we know that during those three last three years, there's been tremendous social and political turmoil in the country. Yeah. So, my, you know, I pretty much have, uh, um, I've, I've had almost a 50 year career, but my big trick is to look at good writing mm -hmm. wherever I find it and to help readers, audiences understand what makes it good. Mm -hmm how to appreciate it, and then how to extract or distill from the best work strategies that you can use in your writing if, if you are an aspiring writer. And, and the big lesson is that that craft is, the craft of writing is neutral, which is to say that very bad players know how to use active verbs too. You know, they know oh. how to tell stories and anecdotes. So craft okay. always has to be married in some way to some kind of civic purpose, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, enriching goal to, to get the best out of this gift with which God or Darwin or both gave <laughs> us. Maybe it was both. 
Yeah, I think so. Maybe it's both. Can you be yeah. an atheist in a anyway? Yeah. Uh, so the title of the book, Tell It Like It Is, A Guide to Clear and Honest Writing. Uh, why did you feel it was important? And you may have answered my question in the previous thing, but I, I want to just clarify it. Why was it important to have the clear and honest part in there? <clears throat> I think um but by the way, you kind of um because I like to lie when I write. I just lie about everything. I'm just so, so tell it like it is. <laughs> is actually uh, an um, it's it's an illusion. A L L U S. It's a it's an homage to one of my favorite songs by Aaron uh, Aaron Neville, uh, the great uh, New Orleans uh, singer balladeer from the Neville Brothers, um, and the lyric is. Tell it like it is. I mean, he's such a wonderful. I'm going to try to sing it. Is that okay with you? Sure, go ahead, man. I mean, with apologies to Aaron Neville, is one we'll of the put greatest it out a tip jar. of all time. There you go. Tell it like it is. Don't be afraid to let your conscience be your guide. All right. So that's. So I said to myself, okay, you know. This is a book about honesty, candor, direct, direct, uh, directness mm -hmm. in communication. And uh, um, I have a hundred-year-old piano behind me, as you might be able to see. Yeah. And so I'm always trying to make connections, being inspired by, um, uh, you know, by writers. And so the uh, the little um, before the book begins. The little epigrams that occur before uh, uh, sometimes the main text. That's one of them. Uh, the the two others you might find interesting. So the second one is quoting President Joe Biden to reporters at the White House in November of 2021. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> where he says to the reporters, "By the way." You all write for a living. I haven't seen any of you explain the supply chain very well. No, no, I'm not being critical. I'm being deadly earnest. This is a confusing time. Okay. And then the third beginning quote, I'll read it and then I'll tell you who it comes from. Okay. <clears throat> I would also like to thank the journalists who put their lives at risk to provide information. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for this service that allows us to be close to the tragedy of that population and enables us to assess the cruelty of a war. Hashtag Ukraine, hashtag peace. Pope Francis on Twitter, oh, wow. March 2022. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in all of those quotes are kind of the main sort of themes and values uh, of the book. Journalists have a hard time. Journalists f find things out, and if they're good, they check things out. But there's like a third step. Uh, actually, there's two more steps. One is to report it out, to make it available to the public. But I would argue that there's a, often a fourth step, and it goes something like this, that the best public writers take responsibility for what readers know and understand about the world. Uh -huh. And that requires uh, a set of tools and strategies, uh, which represent the first half of my book. And the, 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 the main tool is what I would call sort of plain language. Mm -hmm. And the effect is civic clarity. Uh -huh. And civic clarity allows someone like you someone like me to figure out do i need a second booster shot <laughs> there you go there i mean you go. It, it became real right it became yeah. real and and you you talk in your book about the dark and and more dystopian future uh you know how there's so much content uh we have you know propaganda misinformation uh conspiracy theories um, you know, I mean, uh, everybody knows John F. Kennedy, uh, 
uh, is 150 years old right now and is the president, you know, let's get the Q in on stuff, you know, all that stuff. Um, and, and so Elvis. it's hard. Elvis is still alive. I ran into him. I think he's vice day. president under JFK. I think that's how it works. And Nixon is, uh, I think, uh, secretary of the house or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Speaker of the house. Uh, so, you know, and I think it's important to bring this clarity because, uh, a lot of people throw up their hands with reporters, and we have a lot of brilliant reporters on the show. We've had uh, and journalists. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of Pulitzer Prize-winning authors on, and I, I highly respect them. And and to me, you know, searching out knowledge and uh, and finding it, and and knowing you know the good sources to talk to uh, and listen to, uh, probably by their writing because that's usually how I'm exposed to them. Um, is really important and a lot of people I, I i get disappointed because they're just they throw up their hands and they go oh mainstream media is all bad you're just like seriously that just sounds like a lazy man's way to just yeah. not try harder and so i think i think like what you have there is you know you've written about um clear and honest writing is more important than ever because people are are are, are more skeptical than ever maybe yeah you know there's a there's a very there's a there's a writer, a brilliant writer named Ed Young, Y O N G, who writes for the Atlantic. And many people thought he's a science writer. Many th people thought he did the the very best science writing during the pandemic. And uh, a friend of mine interviewed him uh, at the uh, the Pointer Institute uh, where I work. And um, he said something that really felt real, but is a little bit discouraging, which is, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something that I try to avoid, but in this context, it, it makes sense. I try not to use the word Trump uh, as a verb. Uh, you know, I mean, Trump is a, uh, is a verb. Yeah. Uh, which has, which comes from, derives from a, a card game, right? Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. A Trump card. Okay. So uh, he says basically that feelings trump facts. And that's a very discouraging thing for journalists who are trying to gather facts and evidence. Mm -hmm. And to present it to a wide audience, not a narrow one, and with a purpose in mind. And if you know, if it's a responsible journalist, the purpose is, a, of course, is a good one. Mm -hmm. It's like um, public health as a goal, or um, uh, the safety of our children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is a uh, is a is a goal. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think the only thing I think I think one of the things that journalists, the public writers, not just journalists, can do is is just kind of kind of recommit themselves to um, to listening. Mm -hmm to listening even to opinions or people's personal feelings that don't seem grounded in, uh, 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 in the real world in certain ways mm -hmm. to kind of, for me, it's a matter if someone says to me, uh, oh, this didn't happen, or that didn't happen, um, or um, the only patriots marched on the Capitol on January 6th. You know, mm. basically, uh, one of my jobs as, as a public writer is saying, is there a way for me to understand why that person feels that way? Or how that person came to feel that way or what the life experience of that person what the community that that person lives in have sort of influenced um a view of the world 
which I think is incomplete or wrongheaded or maybe even uh, even dangerous. Once you do that work as a journalist, then, yeah, it makes sense to recommit yourself to the basics. There you go. I mean, even when Trump came to the office, journalists had a hard time understanding how to deal with them because normally they would just report what, you know, the president would say. And, and you know, I think what was it? it was the Washington Post, New York Times was keeping a track and it was like 30,000 million lies uh, that they tracked and, and they didn't know how to call him out. I think at first on, on the, on the BS and it, lately they've gotten good at it. You know, there was a recent CNN town hall, uh, where yeah. Kaylee uh, uh, took in, uh, is it Caitlin? Uh, I forget her name. But she uh, she tried calling him out on a lot of his BS and, and tried battling back and forth with him. And, I, and I've seen more and more uh, great journalists on TV and stuff. Whenever a politician starts trying to bull over some BS, they go, whoa, 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 fact checking. And, we're, yeah. you know, you're you're off the park there. But for a long time, it was they were having a really hard time figuring out how to count it because – they didn't want to seem like they were crossing that line of, of being biased, but you know, there had to be a demand for the bias for the truth. Yeah. That's, that's what I mean by the word. Uh, when I talk about the word honest, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really, you know, years ago, if you talk about sort of the ethics of writing and journalism, the two big crimes, the two big sins were plagiarism mm -hmm. where you would steal somebody <clears throat> else's work or fabrication, where you would make stuff up, okay? Uh, those seem obvious, I think, to most uh, journalists now, and I think we see fewer cases of it, uh, at least uh, big public scandals. So the questions that are, were left on the table is, does my desire to be, as a journalist, to be neutral in some things, in some matters, require me to be neutral in all matters? And I think the answer to that is, is no. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why, um, so what, what you would get traditionally in so-called objective or neutral journalist was often a, what we can call a false balance. Well, you got to mm -hmm. represent both sides. Yeah. But now with fact checking as an important impulse and i have to say something uh on behalf of the school that i work for the pointer institute is the um is considered the sort of the center of the fact checking universe uh mm -hmm. that we support uh <clears throat> groups of journalists around the globe in developing their fact uh, checking uh, skills no, fact can be slippery. There's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, I, I like to talk about truth with a small T, like a practical truth rather mm -hmm. than, a, than a capital T. Um, and uh, even in science, as we know, one's understanding of the world uh, evolves and changes. Yeah. And that's a good thing, too, mm -hmm. uh, uh, when we kind of uh, replace... People would say, well, the CDC can't be trusted. These scientists keep changing their mind. And in fact, I think um, it's important for us to, as journalists and public writers, to kind of help people understand how responsible science works, how what we mean by, by evidence, in good evidence in journalism. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the hard thing about COVID was it was, uh, you know, like you say, science is uh, always evolving. It, science is always called a theory because it's, it's evolving and it's learning and it's growing and it's adding knowledge base to its and evidence, uh, evidentiary things. And, and uh, it can, it's very fluid. And that was the big challenge with the COVID thing was it came in a left field. Uh, it was an emergency situation and there was a lot of confusion because, you know, everybody was trying to work together to, you know, save humanity, if you will, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and try and keep deaths from being lowered. 
Um, and, and so it was very fluid and it was very evolving. And it was interesting to me because people had that attitude in the public eye. They're just like, I need an answer. What is it? And then because they couldn't get an answer and understand the fluidity of the situation, um, they, you know, resorted to sometimes conspiracy theories or, sure. you know, some sort of uh, dystopian thing or or just calling people liars. And it was it was really interesting to see. It was probably an, an experiment that maybe you would have of uh, people on a lifeboat or I don't know, people that you put in a in, a, in one of those rooms where they have to figure out how to get out of them and just how poorly human beings can react to uh, centers of stress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um okay. I think for me, um, I would say that um, an interesting analogy. So I think there's a difference between people who are, I would say who are honestly confused uh, and people who were, as always happens, using difficult circumstances to their advantage. Yeah whether it would be political or, or, or economic. And so, for example, um, we know now historically that uh, when smoking became, uh, you know, when the health dangers of smoking became um, more prominent and more public, that, um, yeah, that there was a strategy used, um, uh, sponsored uh, certainly in part by tobacco companies and their allies themselves, which was not to deny, but to cast doubt. Mm. And that casting of doubt allowed many people to keep smoking cigarettes, for example. And more people to die, it should be yeah. noted. Yeah. Um, which is uh, a, a toxic in and of itself. And and now we live in this age of world. I remember when blogging first came out, and they're like, oh, we can do blogging. And, you know, you, you see these YouTube channels or TikTok channels now that can pop up and start collecting money. You saw a lot of the conspiracy theorists during COVID. And even okay. now, you know, you, you see these politically slanted shows that some people just can't figure out that they're politically slanted. They're not telling the truth. They're not after the real facts. They're after the facts of what they see through their lens of the prism. Oh, this president boogeyman bad, this president boogeyman good, you know, he's, mm -hmm. and, and, and they, they, you know, they don't drill down to the facts. Like I, I remember, seeing some uh some of these reporters that were from these dubious uh very biased obviously websites or or online sites you know saying well you know we here here are the facts and you're like did you did you even call to do a fact check on that or did you call the person to get their mm -hmm. side of the story like you know usually reputable agencies will go you know we reached out to the other party and this is their statement or reply from them or we talked to them and interviewed them as well um, you know, they don't do any of that. They just, they just throw up their hands. And so I, I think what you're selling is, is definitely more value than ever before to great journalists and, and, uh, people that we know, you know, for Washington post, uh, and other great, uh, journalistic, uh, things that, uh, work hard. I mean, I don't think there's a perfection to it, but work hard to have, a, a journalistic integrity to their work and try mm -hmm. and present the facts as best they can. Yeah, you know, I think the um, uh, so so one of the let's say one of the tests of um, responsible public communication does the person the, the, does the institution or the writer ever correct a mistake? <laughs> Do they ever admit that they were wrong? <laughs> because we uh, know that some of the sites that you're talking about never admit oh, yeah. that they'd be wrong, whereas that's all they would be doing sort of all, all the time. Well, propaganda is never wrong. It's, it's, a, simple, <laughs> it's a simple distinction. It's a mm -hmm. simple distinction. Uh, the Tampa Bay Times, uh, which is the newspaper that I, um, uh, I'm a contributing writer to here in, 
in St. Petersburg, winner of 14 Pulitzer Prizes over the years. And um, let me tell you, um, they're very serious about correcting mistakes. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the journalists who work there don't want to see their name attached to a correction. You know, mm -hmm. I certainly don't. And so that's motivation for uh, checking and, um, uh, and double checking. I think there's something that there's work that's being done in addition to fact checking that, how shall I say this? Um, we really need to build on collectively. I don't know if it's possible given the, the political divisions in the country, but um, let's call it um, media critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I remember a time when I was a kid when uh, I kind of liked, of course, we watched watching television in its uh, in its infancy, its primary, watching all these television advertisements. I would just buy anything they say. You know, I would just assume that anything you said on it, you wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsi. Then. Okay, let's get some Pepsi. You know, it was just a matter of, mm. you know, the advertising industry sort of uh, persuading you. And then over time, as you kind of grow up a little bit, and if you get the right kind of education, you develop a kind of skepticism, not cynicism necessarily, but a kind of skepticism, which lets you see behind the screen, mm -hmm. lets you see all the appeals, uh, you know, the, the appeals to um, physical beauty, the appeals to um, uh, ruggedness, the Marlboro man, you mm -hmm. know, uh, all of these things. And, and you develop uh, what I think Hemingway referred to as a, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of a crap detector that allows you <laughs> to, uh, you know, yeah. you don't want it to be, uh, you, you know, you don't want it to be too, uh, you know, too tuned up. Mm -hmm. Um or else you'd be uh, uh, too skeptical uh, and couldn't live in the world. But you want it to be there so that um, now you can kind of see, look at a message and understand what the messenger is doing, Yeah. either responsibly or irresponsibly. And we were just talking before, I think if we add artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to the equation. Yeah. You know, um, if people are looking at me now, is this really me? Is this really Roy Peter Clark talking to you from St. Petersburg, Florida? Or is, is Chris Voss got this robot who's, who's just, you know, he's taken like 10 minutes of my speech and 15 <laughs> minutes of my videos and he's created this thing that I'm talking about to you and it's, uh, the monster has arisen. So I, I think um, I think more and more and more we need in childhood education, in secondary and college, and in adult education, we need uh, programs that help people understand um, what's true with a small t and what's fake with a capital F. Yeah, critical thinking. You know, I, I remember watching, I think it was in the 70s, when there was this subliminal advertising that was going on. Yeah. And the, I believe all the advertisers tried to get together and say, hey, you know, this is, there's some ethical issues here. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. You know, they were like, like sex or something would be hidden in, in, in a, some sort of cigarette ad the word sex and and uh and a after i i read about that as when i was fairly young i started looking at angles like what when i when i see an advertisement i'm like okay who is this made for what is the angle that they're coming at me why are they coming at me with this angle right. and i and i apply the same to, to journalism for the most part and and go okay wh what's the angle of this person am i seeing a bias in what they're writing and and clarifying you know 
um, is are they trying to still sell a story about really the facts, or is this is this got an angle on it that like that like that that, that is a slant they're trying to put forth, and that really helps me out. And one of my one of my favorite things to do to people is all uh, you know if we're watching the Super Bowl or something they play TV ads. One of my favorite uh, things that they do um, is they'll show a woman who uh, who doesn't have a diamond ring on. And a lot of people don't notice this sleight of hand. And she's going through some sort of, you know, thing that, uh, you know, her life, whatever. And she clearly needs whatever this product is. And then she finds that product and solves it. And then suddenly she's happy and glowing and her life is wonderful. And guess what she has on? A wedding yeah. ring. Yeah. And uh, most women, I'll point that out to them. I'll go, did you notice that sleight of hand that got played on you? Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, no, I didn't. And most people don't. And just little stuff like that, that sleight of hand that you're like, you know, it's, it, you see those commercials with the people who are like, they're like, oh, do you have the horrible headache? And they've got a face that gives you a headache and they've got mm -hmm. like some music blaring in the background. And you're like, oh, I think I'm getting one now. And they're like, Tylenol, uh, take the headache. And then you see everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's so wonderful. Birds yeah. and trees and a marriage ring. And, uh, you know, it, and it's a sleight of hand thing. It's a play on an angle that, that makes people, you know, and the, you know, suddenly, suddenly there, there's the fulfilled woman with the family and the picket fence, the two-car garage, and they're on vacation Disney. You know, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a hallmark. It becomes a hallmark. It becomes a hallmark commercial. And you know, before she was like, I don't know, there was a, you know, the storms of life, and I don't know, hell and rainfire raining down. So you know, uh, when you, when we're talking <laughs> about this, and if we can go to, um, so there's a tremendous amount of of new and inf new information about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and um i'm getting uh, lo lots of uh, i kind of wrote the book i don't want to have to write another book chris you know i really don't Come on, man 21 but I may have to, you know okay so um yeah, you have the AI write it for you, evidently. What do you think? Yeah, what do you think about uh, artificial intelligence uh, and AI and uh, and what is it? Chat. Chat GPT is the big thing. GPT. Yeah. Do we know what GPT stands for? I, you know, I don't. Neither uh, do I. Uh, I used to say, "What's that stuff in in marijuana? Is it THC?" Yeah. I say, "I want you Chat THC." You know, I thought yeah. that's what I thought it was when the first time I heard it. I think there's a general protect. I don't know. There's probably okay. a thing for it. So, but, uh, I so, pay for it. So I should think you think I know what it was. <laughs> you know, so what I said, what, what I get sort of panic, panic uh, questions. Is this the end of reading and writing? You know, mm. is the, the robot robots taking over. And my um, my first response is a kind of a, my first instinct is to look at at the history of information technologies. Uh, yeah, I was, I, I, um, I'm not bragging. My mom says if it's true, it's, my mom used to say, if it's true, it's not bragging. So I have a, um, a PhD in medieval literature. I know it doesn't seem like it's the most useful thing, but I wanted to study the language kind of from the beginning when I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so when you look, uh, one of the things that happened, let's, let's call the creation of the, the printing press, mm -hmm. right? S uh, there was concerns, interesting, probably legitimate ones, about the effect on people's memories. Ah, that evil printing press. I remember that. <clears throat> yeah, why? Um, hey, Gutenberg. Why do you want to do this and wreck our, uh, you know, not, we don't have to memorize anything. We can just write it and publish it and keep it. Yeah. So that was, that was, uh, you know, one, uh, one crisis. Now, if you go ahead to, let's say, let's go to the middle of the, um, let's go to the Civil War. And the concern would be, why would I want to read in a newspaper a description of Abraham Lincoln standing with his generals in front of the tent. If I can see a photograph of Lincoln standing with his generals in front oh, of the tent. Oh, there you go. 
right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's move to, um, uh, to the 20th century. Why would I need to read uh, a text of Churchill's speech to the British people? Um, we will fight them in the hills. We, you know, what? When I can listen to it on the radio and go on and on and on. And so there's always that threat perceived or imagined <coughs> to literacy from new information technologies. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's say some of those changes do come true, but um, yeah, I mean, I can't be a, um, I couldn't be a, I couldn't become a screenwriter until there was a screen. <laughs> That's true. That's you know true. what I'm saying? Um, uh, I couldn't become a podcaster until there was a, a pod and a cast. So these uh, literacy evolves and uh, uh, adapts in many ways, but this is certainly true as well, Chris. Mm -hmm. There you go. So it, uh, I, want to to, say, I want to add one more thing. Sure. And that is that the technology is always way ahead of the ethics and the standards and the practices that are needed to be included in order that the technology be able to be used in the most responsible way for the public good. There and you I go. think. I think those things are being right discussed right now. People who are, are creating uh, AI are testifying, hey, we're going to be careful here. You know, uh, let's not forget that this can happen and that can happen. We need to be uh, transparent, you know, all of those things. And I'm glad to see that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, even if you're in uh, teaching the high school students, as I sometimes do, um, and uh, they're all getting ready to write their essays to get into the, the college of their choices. Uh, we have to talk about not just the craft of writing, but do they want AI to write that for them? Um, is that going to be uh, a, a path? Are there some things that AI can do, the robot can do to, to contribute to their process mm -hmm. while they maintain the primary voice and authorship of the piece mm -hmm. so i think those things are um, have always been with us and will continue to be there you go uh so i i googled this so we don't sound too unintelligent in the show at least me myself as to what the chat gpt stands for because i never have asked that question i probably should uh and i probably should have asked you know chat gpt but i decided to google it anyway uh but it stands for chat generative pre-trained transformer transformer that sounds like a terminator uh, <laughs> so there it is you go. a robot it is a robot yeah uh as long as it doesn't kill me we're all cool so i gotta robot. tell you i gotta tell you a quick anecdote is that um uh my editor at pointer is named ren laform and i was standing next to him and he had uh he had chat gpt uh he had it up Mm -hmm. He was playing with it, and he said, uh, uh, ask it a question. He said, oh, what do you mean, ask a question? Just ask a question, and we'll, we'll, give it a, uh, we'll give it a run. So my first question to chat GPT was, tell me, what do you think is the more helpful book for writers? The Elements of Style by Strunk and White? or Writing Tools by Roy Peter Clark. Hmm. Now, I have to say that for people who don't know that um, uh, Elements of Style was published originally in 1918 and then redone by E.B. White in the 1950s and sold about 20 million copies. It's the, the most popular and, uh, and best-selling writing book uh, of all time. It's a thin little volume. Oh, wow. And it took about... 15 seconds, and tch, 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 tch. I don't know if there's a noise that comes with it. Tch, 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 tch. And up comes this text, about 10 paragraphs, that does a, I would say, a fair, 
review uh, or a, su a summary of each of the books, a quick summary, uh, and says um, in the, as a conclusion that while the elements of style uh, remains uh, the best selling uh, writing book, um, that there's evidence that writing tools is more helpful to a wider variety of writers. And I say, mm -hmm. that's it, baby. This technology is for me. The robot loves my book, so I'm all in. There you go. I'm there jumping, you go. of course, but uh, that's <laughs> the story. So I pulled up, uh, it, it's interesting, and I pulled up this data uh, about an hour ago. They open AI, the company that uh, developed uh, ChatGPT, has just released its iPhone app. So now you can get ChatGPT from OpenAI. There's a few different API versions that are up there. I was scrolling through here. But now you can get on your phone, and it'll eventually be an Android soon. So uh, interesting, groundbreaking technology right before us here as we're sitting here talking about it. Sure. There you go. Now, let me ask you this. With... with uh, you know these these AI systems, or you know, for example, ChatGPT. Are how how do we know if we're going to be able to establish what you've written about in your book, where we're talking about honesty and and clear writing? I mean, my understanding is that it scrapes the internet, scrapes our knowledge bases, and uh, it. I think the um, the company tries to give it some sort of guide or controls although people have kind of figured out how to jimmy rig around them. Um, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we keep that system honest or how do we make sure that what we're reading coming out of chat GPT is honest? Cause I mean, imagine if I, I haven't tried asking about some sort of controversial thing, like, um, you know, there's those people who always think the world is flat and everyone knows it's really square. It's not round. It's and flat. It's square. Everybody knows that. Uh, <laughs> And just kidding, people. Please don't start a controversy with that. Uh, uh, there'll be a whole cult that will spring up. St. Chris Voss said it was square, and they'll make me God or something, and then we'll have, like, a religion. Um, so <laughs> There are a lot cool. of, let's just say that there are a lot of square people. Um, there you go. There you go. Well, I'm probably one of them. Um, but, uh, you know, how do we, how do we uh, analyze? Do we need to, do, do people who develop AI need to try and make sure that it's honest and clear? uh do how do we how do we develop the skills to look at it and go just because the machine said so doesn't make it true yeah so um i had the chance he was he was, he was uh, a, a guy a scholar who passed away a few years ago named neil postman hmm. from uh, nyu um he uh among his other gifts he was a, uh, a a very wise and interesting thinker about technology and he happened to be coming through st petersburg and uh, i heard that he was coming into our building and i got a chance to to sit with him and uh, ask him try to get at the essentials of how he thinks about technology and new technologies mm -hmm. And he, he offered a formula that I think um, maybe an algorithm, we might call it now, that, that I think continues to work for me. Um, and it goes like this, that any time a new technology is introduced, not just one about communication, but any new technology, let's say about transportation, uh, it brings benefits. Um, and people, when they create it, think about the benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, if they're entrepreneurial, they think the more benefits they ha it has, the more people will want it, the more it will sell or grow or, or more influence it will have. Okay? Mm -hmm. But it has two other things that new technologies almost always do. One is they have unintended side effects. Yeah. Okay. So we're probably, you and I, uh, our country 
has been locked, the world has been locked into conflict in the Middle East, primarily because the creation of the internal combustion engine. Yeah, oil. If there weren't automobiles, if there weren't millions of automobiles, we wouldn't need to extract all that oil, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that automobiles did was, um, I think it had some effect on the, on the environment, on the ozone level. Uh, okay, I'm not a scientist. I'm not trying to even act like one. The other thing uh, that automobiles did is that it changed, it changed cities. It changed the way you didn't have to anymore go to the cities to get what you needed, right? Mm -hmm. It grew the suburbs. It did, uh, and then we needed uh, the interstate highways. And so all of these things, can, can they can't be anticipated. They can't all be imagined. But certainly responsible people with new technology say, what are the benefits? How mm -hmm. can we maximize those? What are the unintended side effects and what's going to be lost as a result of this new technology that we cherish, mm. like maybe the downtown? Mm -hmm. And what can we do to compensate for that loss in some way? Now, that means you, you need um, responsible corporate people. It mm -hmm. means you need philosophers and thinkers and ethicists. It means you need good policymakers. It needs to affect uh, all aspects of um, uh, of education. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's hard for, we wind up doing it usually when there's a catastrophe like Chernobyl or something like that. We, we suddenly now, we pay attention. Mm -hmm. the ways that we haven't in the past. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it develops. And uh, I'd love to see you write a book on AI. Uh, you know, I can still look at uh, the results we get at ChatGPT, and I can still see a robotic. Uh, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? There's a there's a static uh, TikTok to it. There's a there's a uh, tone to it. Or, I don't know if it's a tone. But there's a gate that it has, and gate's the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And it's a very robotic gate, uh, and it withstands human sort of things. Uh, and it's very exacting and, and almost too businesslike, and it's and it's almost like a PR statement. And so I can always kind of tell uh, that, you no, know, maybe it will get better at adapting to, you know, how we, how we use things or humanize things. Um, but... Uh, it, it's interesting to me. Uh, we had someone on the show we talked about before the show. Uh, I had one author on. And he said, "You know, it's not that it, it's not we're going to lose all these jobs and and blah blah blah, but uh, it's also it, it's going to make us better editors." But I think uh, in seeing some uh, PR agencies and people that write uh, companies that are discouraging or outlawing in their companies the use of Chat GPT because they realize the importance of human beings having that muscle in their brain to be able to write well and create well if they if they lose it the other, the other aspect is you know there's copyright issues with chat gpt since it's scraping everything on the internet and creating an algorithm if it were uh, if that's the right word um there there's a bit of overlap there or you know the the lack of origin of the creativity of not uh, of it and if you're mm -hmm. selling creative pr or creative wordsmithing or or marketing or content creation um it's a little hard to do that if if everybody gets the same result when they search in chat gpt it takes away the the novelty so, of it i have a I wish we were we were talking about it in our household not in an academic way uh, mm -hmm. believe me but in a, in a kind of a fun way and um, so I have to be careful because I'm going to say her name, but mm -hmm. 
but I don't want her to react. So, <laughs> Alexa. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I've, she hears I've, me. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes for fun, when my daughters are around, I ask her, "Say, mm -hmm. can you tell me who is Roy Peter Clark?" Uh huh. And in about three or four seconds, you hear this um, eh, eh, twenty-second sort of description in a nice voice mm -hmm. of uh, who I am and what some of my career highlights are and things like that. And uh, now, the reason that she can do that is because I have a Wikipedia page, right? And I, I know she's scrubbing it, to use your word, you know, uh, she's getting these elements off and, and reading it. And I said to, uh, I said, I think she's a robot. I think that's uh, a, a form uh, a sort of a basic form of um, of artificial uh, intelligence. She's not creating it. Someone else created the Wikipedia page, mm -hmm. and uh, she's um, uh, she's reading it. So, um, you know, I think I'll here's my here's my cell phone. Mm -hmm. I'll hold it up. Okay. So here's my cell phone. I never could have imagined halfway through my career, let's say, that I would be so dependent on this device and this technology. <laughs> yeah. If someone had said, are you going to carry a little phone in your pocket? It's going to change the way you see the world and interact with the world, things like that. So maybe somebody could see that but I certainly couldn't see it. So how shall I say it? Uh, I'm loath to predict what communication technology would look like, like 10 years from now, for example, or artificial intelligence. But I do think that what we're talking about, that uh, the need to not just, not just um, talk about, not just, the ability to create the technology, but the ability to create responsible standards and practices for its use, that more and more those two things will need to go hand in hand. Because listen, I've watched maybe a hundred robot movies, maybe more in my life. <laughs> you and I. That never turns out well. It never, ever turns out well. There you go. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Uh, and anything more you want to tease out of the book before we go? Well, uh, I, I would just like to say that, um, let's see if I can get it here. It's a pretty, uh, so I want you to judge my book by its beautiful cover. There you go. Designed by Keith Hayes. And um, it's not just for journalists. It's for writers of all kind, and especially writers who want to make a difference. And uh, it's filled with um, probably more than a couple of hundred examples of the best work that's been created since the onset of the pandemic. Um, so it's the first book I wrote, Chris, with the urgency of an emergency, with the urgency of a breaking news story, mm -hmm. that we need to know this now. We need to learn how to do this well right now. And thanks for uh, chatting with me and uh, calling it to, uh, to people's attention. There you go. And thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. www.roypeterclark dot com there you go and uh fun is fun folks order up the book wherever fine books are sold uh tell it like it is a guide to clear 
and Honest Writing, available uh, April 11th, 2023. So order it up and uh, get uh, that in your bookshelf so that you can write better. You know, I think it's it's, it's important. We, we try and get to the truth as much as possible. Anyway, guys, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com, for Chess Chris Foss, youtube.com, for Chess Chris Foss, linkedin.com, for Chess Chris Foss, where you'll see this on the big LinkedIn newsletter. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys 